The Drum Candy Podcast is brought to you by Drum Factory Direct. What's up, everyone? Welcome to episode six of the Drum Candy Podcast. This is your host, Mike Dawson. I'm coming to you from Drum Factory Direct in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. This week, I'm sitting down with Jason McGurr of the band Death Cat for Cutie. Jason is a wealth of knowledge when it comes to gear. He used to work at a drum shop. He does a lot of repairs. There's a lot of insight into um, some of the nuts and bolts of, uh, no pun intended, of how to get a drum uh, functioning at its optimum. He's also been a studio owner, and um, he really knows the in and outs of engineering and what kind of drums work for recording. He's a producer. He's an amazing drummer. He's a teacher. So we have a nice long conversation here. I'm going to forego any kind of product demo in this one because we have a nice hour with Jason. Uh, We'll get back into messing around with that snare drum next week. I want to do some uh, muffling shootouts, maybe some hoop stuff. So that stuff will come back, but um, I didn't want to I didn't want to edit Jason's chat at all um, because there's a lot of great stuff there. I picked his brain about choosing drums for songs. How to f- I did ask him how to fix up that gig steel snare, so there's a lot to talk about. Also, I got some questions from some listeners, so I want to answer those here. Again, if you have any questions for the show, send them to mike at drumfactordirect.com. So here's a couple. This one came in from Graham. Um, hey, Mike, I really enjoy the new podcast, making me want to spruce up my first snare, a Pearl 13 by 3 Maple Piccolo. You've mentioned on some other podcasts that an instant upgrade to your snare drum would be by changing the hoops to brass. I've never switched hoops before. Would you switch out the top and bottom or just the top? Thanks for all the great information that you provide, Graham. Thanks for the question, Graham. So, good question. I do think, now that drum, hmm, that drum is an interesting one because there's so little shell there. I'm not sure that the hoops put in heavier hoops would be a good idea. I don't know if the brass are actually heavier than what's on there. I don't remember what comes with those uh, pearl piccolos, but let's just say you did. You swapped them out. You can get a chrome over brass triple flange hoop that looks just like a regular steel triple flange hoop. So if you just want to try the top, do that. It'll, It'll look just like what's on there, I'm assuming. Ideally, I would probably do both, but they're, they are expensive. Um, so if you just want to try one, just do the top and get the chrome over brass version. Or if you want to make the drum look funky, get the clear coat over brass and it'll just look like a like a raw brass hoop on top and bottom. That's my suggestions. But with a drum like that, I might actually go with like a lighter hoop. Try like a um, stick saver or a stick chopper or a single flange and see if it opens up a bit more. It's a great drum though. I've had that I've had that exact drum and I loved it. I ended up um, giving it to a good friend of mine's daughter, which started playing drums. Anyway, I hope that helps. Um, I, for me, using brass hoops would be more valuable on like a deeper metal drum. That's just my opinion. Okay, next question. This one comes from Derek. Hey Mike, love the podcast and I've already ordered a couple things from Drum Factor Direct to give me some much needed inspiration. In regards to hoops for snare drums, what are some of the benefits or disadvantages of mixing snare side and batter batter heads? I'm assuming you mean hoops. I know Stuart Copeland is famous for his snare setup um, because I believe Stuart does a die cast on top and a triple flange on bottom. Uh, So I'm wondering about things like that. I'm not sure if this is an idea for an episode or just a question. Uh, let me answer as a question and then we will definitely use this as a full segment in a future episode where we compare hoops but yes i like the combination of a die cast on top and a triple flange on the bottom in general a heavier hoop on top a lighter hoop on bottom if it doesn't bother you that they just don't look the same so if aesthetics are just super important to you i would put a die cast on both sides if you want that die cast sound if you want that more focused, punchier, snappier, um, stronger attack, more controlled kind of sound. Just do top and bottom. But it is cool to put a die cast on top and a thin triple flange on bottom. I feel like it lets the shell resonate more. You get some more, a little bit more snare response. Um, So it's worth experimenting. I think everyone should get 
you know, a few different sets of hoops for your drums just to mess around. You got to stay because even in triple flange, you've got thin, you know, 1.6, I believe is the thickness. You've got, you know, you've got up to 3.0. So you've got like three ranges of triple flange hoops to mess with. You've got steel ones, you've got brass ones, you've got wood hoops, you've got die cast, you've got double flange, you've got single flange, you've got no flange, you've got um, stick chopper, stick savers. So just mess around. I would suggest mess around with a single flange, a triple flange, and a die cast. Just get those hoops, put them on your drums, and see what it does. Okay. Anyway, enough with the questions. Thank you so much. Um, I have a few more here. We'll just answer a couple every week. But I don't want to wait any longer. Let's get to my conversation with Jason McGurr. All right, Jason McGurr, welcome to the show. Thank you for taking the time to join us. Um, how are you doing today? I'm good, Mike. It's been a long time. Since, I know. Since there's no trade shows that. happening right now. It's hard to... Yeah, hard the, to... <laughs> yeah, the last time I saw you was NAMM show of 2019. When was the... When did the pandemic kick in? 2020. 2020. Or 2020. Yeah. Yeah. I got super sick at that show, too. I swear that was probably it, but... You might have got the COVID. You I don't know. Was... Yeah, I... Yeah, that was... um. That was a fun NAMM show, but I remember panicking being, you know, from Seattle area and finding out as soon as I got home, literally four days after I came home from NAMM about the first case in the United mm. States of COVID being in Washington state. Oh, right. Right. And, <laughs> and then I did the math of like where I was and how many people, what is it? NAMM is like 34,000 people a day or yeah, something like yeah. that for four days or at least three of them. And you know, a lot of those from all over the place, obviously, um, and not pointing any fingers whatsoever. But I mean, we all get the namthrax when we're there. We all get sick, mm -hmm. whether it's just from talking too much and having our voices blow out or whatever. But it was a, yeah, I mean, I know this conversation is not going to be about that. But in general, <laughs> it was nice to see you at a time when we could all get together and still right. embrace and talk about gear in person. <laughs> So, I mean, yeah, we're here to talk about snare drums and in particular your first first snare drum and your love and appreciation for snare drums. But I have to ask, because it's been like a time warp, what have you done in the past year to keep yourself productive and occupied and creative? Uh, I have been very invested emotionally and financially in studios and, and recording in general um, since about 2003. I had a commercial studio in Seattle uh, in 2007, but uh, it was only open for, geez, I think three years. And then my wife and I moved out of Seattle about 100 miles north, and I started building another studio at home, which is where I'm at right now. And I started duplicating pre's and compressors and EQ's and mics, and it was just ridiculous to have that much equipment, to have a commercial studio, you know, 32 channel console and it was just um it was too much to run a studio to own and operate a studio in another city i had a great a couple great engineers a great studio manager but at the end of the day as most people who own studios will tell you uh, it is very much a labor of love like it had to be booked a ton you know 20 days a month in order to just kind of break even paying rent in seattle mm. so i decided to sell the place close it down cherry pick my favorite gear just move it up here and i have been actively recording ever since i would say 2003 but more and more over the years doing session work remotely for people and when you ask what i've been doing <laughs> since this pandemic in the past whatever year and a half i have worked more at home in my studio um than i have in the past 10 years uh in my home studio because i've been home you know mm -hmm. not on the road with that cab so <clears throat> i just said yes to almost everything that I was asked to do. And uh, once people started to find out that I could do it, um, that I could, you know, do full multi-tracking and give people a nice neat folder of raw files and, you know, that is the multi-track and stereo drum mixes that sound good, um, they were calling me back or emailing me back for more. So um, I've done a lot of work here at home. Um, I had a lot of investment, and I would say that I've put more time in sitting in this chair at this desk mixing and editing than I have actually back there trying to become a better drummer. But it all works itself <laughs> out. 
that, and, and there's a crap. lot of uh, death cab writing and demoing happening right now. So, has, has the band had any changes of of trajectory for what is going to happen now? Is is touring still going to be the primary mode? I mean, how how do you readjust now that we're slowly getting back open? Yeah. How does anyone? Um, yeah. It's going to be really interesting to watch things come back online. It's a conversation I have with you know friends all the time. Uh, there are venues that have closed. I don't know if mm. you know the same text will be available if they moved on, or if you're doing your own thing. You know, if you're just climbing in a van and going around the country, like everything is going to have changed. What hasn't changed, though, I think, is people's thirst for seeing live music. And the, mm. the first few shows we've announced after being um, down all this time. Uh, I'll back up a little bit just to say that we were scheduled to be down. There wasn't that many shows planned for 2020 that we had to cancel. So this was sort of in between album cycles. But the few shows that have gone up for sale and um, our friends that have been you know, starting to book tours, it seems like there's a real fervor. Like People really do want to go back out and see live music, which is exciting. Um, uh, so we will slowly inch our way back. I don't think, you know, we've been in the process of working on a record, um, mostly demoing, but it's uh, it's it's coming into pretty clear focus. Uh, but I don't I don't think that'll be in 2021. It'll probably be a 2022 release. Um, mm. But it's still a goal and something to work towards, which I will say that if I didn't have goals, if I didn't have a band that was holding me accountable for writing music and recording parts, um, or other people ask me to do session work, that this whole downtime would be pretty morally crushing. So it's, it's good to be busy and to have projects. Is, the, is everything being demoed out remotely, or is anyone coming over to your place? No, we all have, we all have studios at home, okay. and some of us more full-blown than others, but it, that doesn't matter. It's not like what we're trying to do is... I mean, you never know. Sometimes you, you record something by accident, like poorly, and it's got such a cool vibe that, you know, it makes a record. I mean, every mm -hmm. time I show up to work with a band uh, or my band or whatever, and someone brings in some hard drive full of, here's my demos for the record, every time something gets used from that batch or from mm -hmm. that hard drive, it just works that way. I think that there's... There's always magic that can be caught, you know, with inspiration that just someone happens to hit record and they capture a moment. Um, and like I said, sometimes that's a, sometimes that's a mistake. Sometimes it's a really shitty, not well thought out mic set up for miking, you know, set up for a drum kit, and it just has a vibe that you can't beat <laughs> when it comes time to do the real thing. But all that being said, we all we are all working remotely, uh, but the goal is to do it together, you know all of us all five of us live on the floor because that's that's when i think the most honest performances come about not necessarily the re the remote ones not saying that a, there can't be great remote you know recordings made but we would like to be together has everything you guys done thus far been live in the room uh yeah for the most part i mean we you know historically we will maybe try to do something as a whole group or maybe work in pairs. If there's a scratch vocal and a, a uh, uh, you know, a rhythmic, you know, percussion loop or something to play to, we might work in a, a group of two or three. Um, every time we're fortunate enough to be with a producer that has a big enough room, and we can all be live on the floor, then we all, you know, we track live. Um, mm. But it really, it's song dependent. There are some songs I think that are best worked on in more sectional type stages and there are some songs that the energy just needs to be everybody live on the floor so sometimes that's digital sometimes it's analog capture um i think the older i get and the longer i do this the more i recognize though that when it's working it's obvious to everybody it's not just mm. a not like you got to convince someone in a room that that was the take you know or that's the sound or that's the performance. I think when everybody reacts, which again is can only happen when you're in the same room. I, maybe I'm old school like that, but um, I, here I say that, and you got you know Billy Eilish making bedroom records that that sell way more than any of us will ever see. <laughs> but you know, 
they they've got a they've got an amazing thing going on and i have the utmost respect for them as artists and andrew marshall as well so i mean that's a um that's a whole separate animal than what we're doing yeah i mean you probably figure she and her brother are in the room a lot writing yeah it's not like they're that, working that independently that qualifies i mean, i saw the documentary when it came out and um yeah they're capturing real moments you know even the ones on the bus, you know, where they have a little mobile rig and they're in a bus bunk. But I think, you know, I had a conversation with a with a, a, a great producer just this morning about how and when to capture. And his whole MO is like, you just, the things that translate are those that are brutally honest. Mm. And uh, I think that when you're bearing yourself, like in front of people, whether it's on a live stage or in a studio and you've got your band with you or other artists or people like when when a real honest performance comes out and it's good and it's captured and people are there to witness it's like a speech it's like a great speech like it really really resonates so to me those are the those are the recordings that stand the test of time that we all go back to and and really react to when um when we hear them for the first time so I want to I want to work my questioning backwards than what I was originally going to do since we're on that that mode. How do you choose gear for a session, and then how do you know when it's the right gear for the session? And then I guess the piggyback is: Has there ever been a time when you had the wrong gear and it was the right vibe? <laughs> <laughs> yep, to both of those questions. Um, <laughs> okay. How do you choose gear for a session or a song? Um, uh, to me, drums, I mean, if that's what we're talking about here, um, the drums, much like a guitar or a piano or some melodic instrument have, you know, they have tone, they have pitch. And, you know, if someone's singing, a vocalist is singing and there's a pure note that's not sharp or flat, but totally in tune, you can hear it, you can feel it, it resonates. To me, my snare drums, I tune and you know, set up in a way that to me they are in tune with the track. For instance, if I've got um, a really open, slow piece of music where the tones are dark, of course I'm not going to put up the 4x14, you know, brass shell with the die cast hoops. That's not necessarily the right vibe unless I tune myself and play that drum whisper quiet, dead center. Mm. Maybe with some kind of a big fat snare drum or a mute or a, you know a, a you know a quesadilla or something on top but to me it's it's as much about picking colors for a wall right you wouldn't put you know i don't know maybe you'd put red orange and uh and whatever ugly green on on one wall but it wouldn't be very complimentary so the whole kit symbols their duration you know their color your snare drums, um, their duration, literally duration, like how long is your snare drum note in the track? How does that affect tempo? Um, uh, your bass drum resonance, your tone, whether you're using a felt beater or hard beater, everything. Your stick weight, right? Maple sticks are going to sound different than hickory sticks, nylon tips. Like all those gear choices for me um, have been of paramount importance. And the way that I know a drum is right for a track, um, if, if we're sort of moving down the snare drum path, mm -hmm. is whether the duration and tone and color of the drum is complementing the track, taking away from it, or if it's not noticeable and too transparent. Um, mm. So again, there's, I mean, there's 25 snare drums right behind me right now, and it's not uncommon for me to cycle through a half dozen of them so I'll know what I'm after when I start, but it's not uncommon for me to cycle through a half dozen and put them up and hit record and just do a single pass and do the same thing. I might loop like a 16 bar section with different drums so I can cycle through the playlist and hear which one is, is the most appropriate for the track. Because it's, it's hard to tell sometimes when you're sitting behind the kit compared to when, you, when you're not playing and you're just listening to how something is sitting, you know, how it feels, how it impacts the track. Um, and, I mean, 
I'm also talking about a lot of stuff I do at home, but in studio, you've got the, the help of the engineer and the producer and your bandmates maybe saying, I think that snare drum's tuned too high or too low or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, I, it, I don't want to sound like I'm overthinking it, but I, I this is the way I've made my living and career is, is not so much pursuing, you know, 30 second notes, but sound design, like how mm -hmm. to get drums to be interesting and unique and also have their sound be a big part of why the song groups, you know? Um, much like when we all put our wallet on our snare drums, we think and feel and play a certain way, you know? Um, right. Or when we want to be really wide open and there's an ambient loop going on and we can press the hell out and distort our snare drum and have it wide open and rim shot it with two inches of stick tip, you know? We want that ringy, raw, you know, weird bend in the note, like... You just have to ask yourself and the people around you what's going to be the appropriate sound and vibe to make this song feel good. Oh, and then your yeah, your the, other question: How do you know if something's wrong? Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, there are some songs in our catalog where I, I love the song and I love the track. The feel went down. The vocal was a great performance, but I beat my I like. I'm like, oh, why did I not put a front head on the bass drum? Or why did I rim shot and not hit dead center? Um, so there's some songs I don't like the sound of. And that's not to, you know, put any judgment or, you know, hang, hang a producer or an engineer out to dry. It was just, at the time, it seemed like the right thing to do. And in retrospect, it just didn't age well. <laughs> mm. So um, there are some songs like that. And there are some songs that I that went down that I hated how they sounded. Like maybe somebody manipulated or like ran the entire kit through some filter and like took all of the vibe away. And and now I'm like, oh, that was a great choice that I didn't hear mm -hmm. at that point in time. But it really made that song, you know, stand alone and, and set apart from anything else. And then the song winds up wind up being like a single, like that kind of a thing. So there are there are all different types of scenarios. You just gotta roll with the punches. Um like I said, this all comes back to that being honest thing. If you're just honest with your choices and your performances and what you feel is the right thing to do and everyone else like believes you, if you're believable and it's confident, then those sounds and choices usually they usually work out. Okay, so here's another two parter. Um, knowing that you have an extensive collection and you have pretty much every sound available. What do you look for when you're going to add a new drum to your collection? Mm. And then the That's other tough. side of it is what would be your core three drums that are like, you have to have those? Um, what do I look for in a new sound? Um, uh, I, I have been, I've had so many nice snare drums that I look for bad ones more, <laughs> more often now. <laughs> Oh, I've got one for you right here. <laughs> yeah, look, I, I do too. I'll just I'll just pull it out. Like my bandmate Zach Ray found this for fifty bucks, and this pretty much says it all right here. Oh yeah, I have not changed these heads. You can see how corroded the shell is. You know what this is? I mean, dude, right? But these drums, <laughs> this drum, I mean. I have a, a piece of Velcro on the side just to keep the, the throw off from, because if you hit it too hard, the throw off like <laughs> buckles and fades. The wires are bent. I mean, I, I heard this great story, quick footnote about Steve Gadd in Nashville. And I don't know who it was, but he had recently moved a kid out there. And whoever set up his drums that day saw that his wires were bent. And Steve could confirm or deny this, but saw that his wires were a little broken and bent, so the tech replaced the wires for the session. And Steve sat mm -hmm. down on the kit and he was like, did you change my wires? Where are they? <laughs> I, I need them back on the drum. So, I mean, I, so yeah, I look for, I mean, there was a piece of whatever, there was something on the bottom of those wires that was not reminiscent of the way that drum sounds. It sounds incredible. It sounds like a, like a cure like disintegration snare drum. What is that drum? Just a cheapy... Yeah, it's equivalent curl? of like a forum, you know, or a, a yeah. blue on, or, I mean, it's a it's a no-name, like, CB700. Yep. You know, that's Taiwan exactly drum. Right here. Yeah. It's got an internal <laughs> mute, but it sounds amazing, and 
it it affects how I play. If I put a Craviato snare drum up and that up, you're going to have two entirely different performances, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's just, it's like, uh, you know, s snare drum sounds in particular to me are like filters, like visual filters, right? Like depending on whether you want a, you know, a vintage hazy Super 8 vibe or you want a crystal clear 4K, 8K image. Um, mm -hmm. And then everything in between, right? Uh, if you want a scratched lens, maybe that's busted snare wires, you know, with, mm. a, with a rattle or some washer that's floating around on the inside of your drum or keys on top of your drummer. Or, or I mean, there's so many prepared ways to make a drum sound unique and interesting. On our um, uh, one of the releases we had a few years ago was a, called the Blue EP. Um, I had a a broken distortion pedal on top of the snare drum. And every time I hit it, it bounced on top of the snare drum and it bounced like a delay in time, but you heard all the busted parts inside of it also bouncing and rattling. And so not only <laughs> did, was it heavy enough to make the drum head super dry, um, uh, it was uh, rattly and, you know, artifacty, but that made the track, you know, or that, that particular sound for me. And it was on top of a superphonic. So it didn't really matter in that case what the, what the shell was. Um, I will say also, the only other thing I, I look for in snare drums these days is something that would set it apart from other snare drum sounds that I've heard. So if we all know what an Acrylite does, or if we all know what a, you know, a, the 4160, the Gretsch Chrome over Brass does, or if we all know what the Ludwig 8, you know, 8 lug Maple does versus the, the Brass shells, mm -hmm. um, I am more interested in finding a shell that sounds different from something that I already have or that I've heard. For instance, there's a there's a Keplinger shell I have that is uh, offset lugs. Um, so no two lugs. No two lugs are the same distance apart. Oh, weird. So, and this drum has a really, really unique, weird sound and feel to it. And I don't think there's that many of them, but um, you know, it kind of has like an, if for anyone that's thinking about modern drums, it's got like an A&F look and vibe to it. It's got black iron mm -hmm. hoops, but that drum was the drum on Death Cab's uh, Summer Skin from Plans. Mm. Um, but again, you hit that drum, much like the, the, the CB700 I just pulled up. Those two drum sounds compared to like a Superphonic or a Brass or Craviato or whatever i mean it's um totally different worlds so i am i am again looking for things that are sound less like a very atypical snare drum and i'm going to blame that on the fact that we've been you know so immersed for decades you now in a world of programming that mm. i think that if i presented a very quintessential this is a good drum sound to a younger artist they would be turned off by it and that's a bit of a bold statement, but I really feel like so many kids have gotten into programming and manipulating and having, you know, what their ears want to hear come directly from a content library. Uh, mm -hmm. That if we as drummers are not thinking about that and competing with those sounds and making them just as interesting or just as dry, that sometimes we get overlooked despite how good our groove or our time or our playing is. That, that's my belief anyway. So mm. I will often take a great sounding kit and signal chain and path, you know, great mics, pre's, compressors, amazing drums. I mean, you add it up, it's like, it's a really expensive way <laughs> to get music from your mind to somebody else. I will do all that and then I will destroy the drum sound and filter it and make it small and make it really, really weird. And that's often what excites people that have been making records on laptops for, you know, their whole music career. Yeah, I mean, I think of Nine Inch Nails has been doing that for yeah. decades. I mean, that was for me in the 90s. Like, man, how do you get that snare drum sound? I had no right. idea if it was programmed or live. I had no idea, but I loved it. I like that question. I like when something is so galvanizing that you have to really think about what it is. But... It's almost like it's broken, but you don't. You want it to be broken, like you know, to sound mm. like. I don't like that. This is like I remember when I heard songs for the deaf, and 
the drum sound was so weird. I was I was wanting to have like this public opinion about how much I didn't like the drum sounds, and that changed after the record was done. You know, I listened to it again. I was like, this is amazing. And then I did as much investigation as I could about how those drums were recorded. You know, so I mean, it was yeah. Who wants to hear what's been done? I mean, uh, mm. yeah. I mean, we can. Good point. We can. We could. We could go down a big rabbit hole of recording and production in general. But I don't know. Maybe you want to target more on the history of, of snare drum infatuation. <laughs> well, I, I mean, this is probably an impossible question to follow up with. But I'm not. I'm going to come back to your your three like Swiss Army drums. We'll sure. come back to that. But. Um, what would you say is the perfect snare drum sound? Documented. I think not, the perfect not ephemerally. Documented, right? Mm -hmm. Documented. I think the perfect snare drum sound documented is a. I mean, I'll just be as simple as I can. A medium tension, um, relatively dry center hit snare drum. I think you can add attack. I think you can add sustain. You can change the pitch <laughs> these days. You mm. can add reverb. So if you want, if, if if someone needed, if someone said, "I need one snare drum sound from you, one, make it as neutral as possible," which I get asked all the time, so that I can do what I want, um, mm. I would say that that is the equivalent of um, of uh, a center hit medium tension coated ambassador snare drum without too much ring. So some kind of tone control, whether that's a gel or a snare weight or something. Um, and not taking away, not making it too dry, but just, I mean, does that answer your question? Like in terms of snare drum sound or were you looking for a specific model? <laughs> I mean, I I love that answer. I was also, well, let's, let's stick with it. I was going to also want to know like documented on record that exists in the world that someone could go listen to. And like, that is the best sounding snare drum. Oh, ever. that's... <laughs> How is that possible, man? <laughs> How is that possible? It's like you've got, I mean, I mean, you've got <laughs> Zigaboo, you've got... Yeah, that was going to be my choice, choice. Yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, I, that's an amazing snare drum sound. Like, I think that, you know, Yaki Libazit is an amazing snare drum sound. I think that Matt Cameron and Spoonman is an amazing snare drum sound. Or, mm. or you know, Black Hole Sun. I think that, um, you know... Any Al Green record, any Gadsden sound. I mean, it, that is impossible to answer. Like a single one yeah. snare drum sound. I. That's, that's why I led with the here's here's the snare drum sound that I think is useful and <laughs> in all, on all accounts. <laughs> um, I think one of my favorite snare drum sounds is a. Even though I'm a very devout Gretsch artist, all love to Gretsch, um, but one of my favorite snare drum sounds is a um, is a toss up between the Gretsch Chrome Over Brass 5-inch rim shot mm. or a Acrylite rim shot. Mm. Those two drums and that sound um, in terms of general attack and presence, I think are, you can't go wrong. I don't, I don't go anywhere without those two drums. Um, and I'm, I'm, uh, I have a lot of brass drums. I've been a fan of brass snare drums for a long time, but I don't know. I don't want to derail the, the point of your conversation, but one snare drum sound. I don't know. I'm going to flip it back. What's your, what's the quintessential, what is the marker of the best snare drum sound for you? I think uh, it changes all the time, but I think, See? yeah. I think pretty much any drum Steve Jordan hits is the best snare drum sound I've ever heard. In most cases, yeah. Well, he's got every single yeah bit but it of that. Sounds like him <laughs> considered and dialed. I mean, you know, and the groove is here. You, I mean, it's not like you're looking at one kit, right? Like he's yeah. considered, he's considered how it's like wine pairing, you know, especially mm. with that guy. Like <laughs> he's like, if I just hit this with my sweater hanging over my hand, it's going to sound that much better. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> No, I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, geez, trying to, you know, these are the kind of things that you and I can talk about, but it's really hard to talk about with new drummers. I sneak it yeah. into lessons with kids sometimes, like, 
you know, we'll take a detour from the curriculum or the exercise and talk about things are sounding even over just Zoom and I have them tune a little bit or put something on top of their drum or change where they're holding the stick, right? Like choke up, come back. Um, I, I think that having an extremely dynamic conversation with someone where someone gets really excited about what they're saying or, you know, just really backs off and gets dark about something is a good lesson and a reminder of how we can play. Right, how we can mm-hmm. approach playing our snare drums. And to me, drumming has always been this landscape where we're cruising along. We're just we're just one of the ranges in the, on the horizon, right? We're the drummer and there's the vocalist and whatever. You see road signs, another part of your band. Uh, but we have these moments and these opportunities in between lyrics, in between, you know, setting up choruses or, you know, second verses or whatever, where we can exercise not just drum fills, but like sound design and approach like do you play a drum harder do you play a drum lighter and i think that that kind of textural input really makes the track interesting and snare drums man whether you play into the head or off of the head or Mm -hmm. you know a flam versus a single hit a rim shot versus dead center all that kind of stuff really brings personality and, and excitement into any performance and steve jordan perfect example somebody that does that um I would argue that Steve, I mean, he's incredible, but I don't know if he spent as much time. I'm just going to take a guess that he didn't spend as much time uh, trying to focus on one sound. He was trying to focus on all the sounds as a player, right? Like Mm -hmm. all the different vibes and approaches depending on the music and how it fit in. It's important to do. Well, let's go back to your your, um, mythical medium tune drum (laughs) what does that mean first of all what what drum would you grab what does medium tuning mean to you because that seems to be you know personal uh, for player to player and then you know what do you do to the drum to get it to that like this is your best sounding version of an all-purpose snare drum that i can give you greg keplinger once uh put it to me i think it was greg who said when tuning drums, you need to find out where the drum lives. Mm. And if you obviously we know if we tune drums too high, they choke, right? They don't they don't give back. If your top head is so tight that the bottom isn't reacting or resonating, or you get you get just the sound of a not the the body of the shell, no resonance or reaction from the rest of the drum, but just the top of like like the top head saying, I'm so tight, I can't move. You know, like that mm-hmm. kind of tension. I would say that the drum doesn't want to live there. If you're too low, granted, we've all seen the tricks where you detune whatever, however n- number of, you know, how many number of tension rods and maybe just one or two in the bottom head and loosen your wires, like that's a cool sound too. But again, that is a very one dimensional flat, you know, the rest of the drum mm-hmm. isn't going to react. So meeting to medium tuning to me is if you tune a drum head to the point of choking and then you back down. Uh, to where it doesn't feel like it's choking, like the whole drum is reacting. And then you start with your wires loose and you slowly tighten them as you finger tap to go from the sound of a tom to the sound of a crisp, snappy snare, not too buzzy, not choked, you know, or you could tune the wires past the choke. So you're starting to give the sound of a tom again and then you back it down. I mean, I'll just show you by example what I'm talking about. Um, by the way, the the Brooklyn here's another grass plug here. Sorry, the Brooklyn Broadcaster, or sorry, the Brooklyn uh, drums compared to the Broadcaster or the USA Customs are really kind of hidden secret weapons. I mm-hmm. high for, for snare drums in particular. But so anyway, so if this drum is medium tuned right now, I would back off the wires. so I'm hearing them buzz bring them up until they just start to get snappy I don't know if you can hear that in the mic Mm -hmm. but if I go any tighter there's that ring and tone I mean you know this as a drummer but for people that don't think about it wires there um, add a medium tension 
-hmm. I generally find the tension of a head without wires on. I like to feel, you know, uh, w it's easier for me to tell whether the drum is choked if I'm not listening to the wires. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know, it's hard, hard to explain other than, you know, if you're in the same room with somebody, but um, I can't tell you that's a certain number of drum key turns, right? It depends on whether mm -hmm. it's a 10 lug drum, a 12 lug drum, an eight lug drum, a six lug drum, because tuning a six lug drum is a totally different animal. And, I mean, there's not a lot of them out there, but I think also the other thing that would determine whether a drum is medium or too high or too low is uh, if you go to rim shot it and um, it's too ringy, that might mean that there's that it's a little too tensioned or high. Mm, okay. That that being said, I wouldn't. Uh, uh, you know, maybe that's the right sound for the track, right? Like maybe, mm -hmm. maybe you want a, a dichotomy. Maybe you want, maybe the whole bed of music is this low synth rumbling, slow tempo thing. And Steve Jordan <laughs> would probably reach for a 12 inch snare drum, right? Like that mm -hmm. would be, that's cool when you set those things apart. James Blake is an artist. I mean, it's, I think it's 99% program, but like is a, is a great example of someone that, you know, an electronic artist that mixes really high sounds, especially snare drum sounds, with um, super low bass and like a lot of airy open stuff. Um, but for the kind of music I make in my band, to simplify the answer, that's why I went with a medium medium tuned snare drum. All right. So you had mentioned Chrome over brass Gretsch, the uh, five by fourteen, mm -hmm. and an Acrylite, which is a five by fourteen. Mm -hmm. Uh, aluminum. Mm -hmm. Painted? Do you have a, a particular finish acrylate that you prefer? Uh, you know, I've gone back and forth on the, the sort of the 60s, you know, vibe and the and the painted. I think I prefer the 70s blue and olive acrylate, okay. which is funny because that's like the very first drum that every, you know, so many, not every, but sixth grade band yep. drummers were given in the black plastic case, right? And it was like yep. a dusty holy yep. grail that nobody realized <laughs> they had. And it like it was like my crappy snare drum rental from school. <laughs> and yeah, now, exactly. <laughs> it's like it's under my arm, you know, wherever I go. Um, but the the Gretsch is the first one I put up. Um, the you know what I've been a big fan of is I discovered a few years ago the phosphorus bronze Gretsch six and a half, which okay, is okay. I don't know that one. Which is the close twenty seven pounds. That's probably why you don't know it. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a rare one, but it is the closest thing to um, uh, like the Sandcast Tama Bell Brass vibe. Really? Yeah, and I I saw some shootout. I think it was um, was it Portsmouth? What's the drum shop? Portland, Maine, or out in uh, New Hampshire? New Hampshire. Yeah, you know the one I'm talking about. I'm totally spaced mm -hmm. on the name right now, but anyway, they had like a here's all the heavy brass drum shell. You know, we did a shootout with modern bell brass and this and that mm. and that. And the phosphorus bronze Gretsch was the um, was the closest to my ears, but it's like twenty seven pounds. But oh, this nice. drum, what's cool is you don't. I mean, important important thing to mention here. Um, and we can get really deep into snare drum sounds, but. Uh, Something I learned a long time ago was the balance, was a consideration of the balance of the drum set. So when I would go see bands play in Seattle, you know, all ages shows when I was younger, I hated it when the drummer had a super loud component of his drum set that mm -hmm. like took away, like just killed the mix, just crushed everybody. So sometimes you get a drummer with a really high tuned, heavy brass drum and the rest of his quit rest of his kit is like quiet and dry and cymbals are like thin and papery and splashy and it's completely out of balance and to me that is not a cool thing so um i love greg he's a greg keplinger is a great friend i've had several of his drums he has very powerful drums i have more control now than i did when i was younger and playing him but when i first started acquiring keplinger serums I had to change the drum set. I had to have a, I couldn't use a vintage Ludwig kit. I had to use a more modern shell, six ply mm. that had more volume, sustain. 
I had to, I couldn't use, you know, super dark jazzy cymbals. I needed cymbals that would keep up with the snare drum because that was sort of my, that was my fader that was at Unity was the snare drum sound. That was the center of my playing and what was coming across to an audience. And so I needed to pair those things appropriately. That being said, you know, I have an old Kent that is like a six lug. You and I could have a conversation and this drum wouldn't interrupt, right? <laughs> and it's still got a calfskin head on it. The last thing I'm going to do is pair that with, you know, Zildjian Avidus 20 inch crashes. Like, yeah. nobody's going to do that. So, you know, that balance of snare drum volume, dynamic range, you know, how, how much a drum will open, whether a drum chokes, if you, if you, got a you know that kent i couldn't play that in a rock gig it would just die it would just be mm -hmm. fall apart right this phosphorus bronze um has a really much like the, those sandcast brass um has a really great way of sounding gorgeous at low volumes and will go sky's the limit as hard as you want to hit it or you know play it and it doesn't like it doesn't take over your whole mix it doesn't take your drum sound and just make people want to go like, holy shit, you know, I got to turn everything down. So, um, yeah, I don't know where we... It's a, kind of a slight sidestep, but get into the kind of studio options. Do you tend to choose a quieter drum in recording just for that fact, so it allows your toms and everything else to... Oh, that's a good question. I choose a drum set for the room. Hmm. So if I'm in a small studio, I do not have a loud kit. Because when you have mm -hmm. a loud kit in a small room where the ceilings are low, cymbals included, um, your drum sound can kind of suck unless you have enough control to play really quiet. Um, if I'm in a big room uh, and the ceiling's high and there's a lot of air, I'm not too close to the walls, then I might choose a louder kit. Um, how I play it depends on the track. But I think that some of the coolest drum sounds in history have been captured by playing really quiet and um, not oversaturating a room with drum sound. Uh, if you go to Sound City in Los Angeles, which is where um, Wildflowers was recorded, you know, and um, I mean, it smells like Teen Spirit happened in that room, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, Rick Springfield records have been made there, Elton John records. Um, we, Death Cab did a track there called um, you're a tourist and mm -hmm. that was a WFL five and a half inch eight lug relatively dry drum but I could there was enough the ceiling was high there was I could smash it in the room allowed for that kind of volume and it didn't uh, it didn't have the opposite effect it didn't make it sound crappy it made it sound better so even though that drum was dry um, it totally opened up because of the size of the room so I does that answer your question about Room size yeah, and drum yeah. choices. So, yep, hundred percent. Okay, so you chose three metal drums. What would be your one wood drum? And then we'll actually get to the the main question, which is what was your first snare drum? But so yeah. if you've got these three metal drums. Then what would be your your counterpart to that? Um, my probably my favorite. Um, well, on this shelf right here, I have three that I love. One is the. Um, of a Craviato, six and a half by fourteen maple poplar maple um, mm. baseball bat edges that Johnny made for me when I was a Craviato artist, and it is one of my favorite drums. There's no denying that the man knew how to make snare drums, but this being a combination of poplar for dry, maple for bright. Um, bad edges for focus um, really uh, allows it to live in that space that I mentioned as being a versatile good place to start. Medium tuning is not a problem. There's not a lot of overtune, uh, overtones. It's a super sensitive, you know, snare drum. Johnny had a really good job of uh, the way that he cut his his um, snare beds. And this drum, I mean being solid wood as well. Anyone who's played, you know, high in snare drums knows there's a real difference. And his wood drums sound more like metal drums than uh, 
than any other wood drum, I think. But um, the as far as Gretsch and what I'm playing with them, um, the um, this little guy that you know very well. Oh yeah. We have a common friend that helped develop this drum. Uh, That's right. Brooklyn standard, right? Isn't that what it is? Yeah. yeah. Five and a half by fourteen. Yep. Um, five and a half is a great size. I, I use six and a half live a lot, especially the chrome over brass. But this Brooklyn standard is has kind of become like an acrylate for me. Like a very versatile go-to. Uh, works great if you're rim shotting. Works great if you're not rim shotting. Um, can dry up real easily or you can crank it up and it withholds it doesn't choke you know the shell is thick enough that there's rigidity in it and if you crank on it it doesn't like go i can't make any sound so it, it really can open up and it records really really well also the fact that it's eight lugs instead of ten um, makes it kind of magic um, and then the other wood drum so that's craviato the um the Gretsch brooklyn standard um Probably, it's a toss-up between the USA Custom. This is a mahogany ribbon um, mm. wrap, but it's a six-ply maple gum maple USA Custom shell. This is a um, eight lug. Um, or this classic one here that goes with me a lot of places. I'm actually going to quiz you and see if you know what this is. Is that a... I don't know what that is. It's a Slingerland. Yep. I don't know. Is that I don't the three-ply Radio King? It's a what? The, student, the artist model Radio King, whatever they called it, the three-ply? Yes. No, it's solid shell. Oh, that's, that's the solid shell. Solid shell, but it is an artist model. It was the Ray McKinley. And oh, nice. the top hoop actually shipped with uh, a wood hoop, which I have on the other side of the room. And the wood hoop had claw hooks that didn't go over the top. They went through the middle of the, the wood hoop. So there were holes cut. Weird. And uh, so you wouldn't ever hit, you know, like a nickeled brass, not, you know, like bump when you're doing rim shots. Seven by 14, um, found it in the back of a music store I was working in in Seattle that primarily dealt with trades called Trading Musician, and it was collecting dust, and I was fixing drums for him at the time, and it was like pushed way in the back, and I was like, I know what this is, a cloud badge. And so I approached mm. the owner, I was like, can I can I buy this? And I think he knew, but he also was, you know, he was on my side, and I think I bought it for 250 bucks and put it together. Ooh, all right, all right. <laughs> but seven by 14, yeah, that, that solid maple shell, and again, I mean, I I, tr I try to use as much, you know, of the the Gretsch line as I can, and they they have plenty of options for them. But some of these old standards and standbys, it's just it's hard to get away from those tones, you know. Um, yeah. And this drum in particular too. Right now, it's set up with, I guess, a bovid, um, bovid head. But it's uh, <laughs> yeah, that's a whole nother thing. I mean, we're <laughs> we'll we'll stay out of the head conversations, but. I'm yeah, I'll bring you back on. Um, we're gonna do. We're gonna go <laughs> down the rabbit hole in this show. We're gonna go drum heads. We're gonna go hoops. We're gonna do wires. Oh, so, oh, I'll bring you back on again. <laughs> I, I gotta. I gotta throw in one special special edition, which is, which is this drum. Um, I also, if I'm showing up to the studio with four drums, the old Ludwig 1920s, um, ten lug. Mm. You know, two-piece brass shell is unlike any other. Super dry. I mean, and when you want to crank this drum up and you want to sound like a certain record or era, it's there for you. Mm. Uh, but I don't take any of these vintage drums out on the road ever. My, yeah. you know, Death Cab and the live stage and um, even in the studio, like it's all whatever is available today that you can go buy that can also be replaced. Mm -hmm. But um, segue. Do you want to you want to talk about the first drum ever? The first. Yeah. What was your first snare drum? Well, my well, we talked about already. My first snare drum, which I did not see or hear, was the Acrolite. Um, 
sixth grade band, but again, that was just an ugly gray drum, right? I had no idea. Yeah. So that, that went away <laughs> and I didn't think about that. I couldn't wait to get a real kit, my own kit, not the one the school <laughs> provided, right? And my dad was living in Oklahoma at the time and um, found someone that owned a music store in the 60s, closed it down, and um, still had some new old stock inventory left over. And I would love to say I'm baiting you for a great setup here, but it's just a segue into the real Snowdrum story. Um, this guy, we went to his house, we went into his shed, and he pulled out an old packing slip, and it was a Ludwig classic dance combo or something like that. And it included symbol, Zildjian cymbals and a uh, four-piece Ludwig kit and snare drum. We never opened the boxes. I was not interested in a Ludwig drum set. I wanted the Ferrari Red Pearl Export. Of course. That was in the, <laughs> that was that was in the front shop window, a little downtown Bellingham, Washington. So I was like, and the guy offered us, the, I think he was like, oh, I don't know, $300 or something like that for the whole setup. And I was just, Koosh, like, did not even bend. And I was like, I, I don't know what I was thinking. So I walked away from that kit, whatever it might have been, in those boxes. Oh, no. <laughs> um, and I got for my birthday a Ferrari Red Pearl Export. So the first snare drum was a Pearl Export. And I put probably emptied a roll of electrical tape to make a square, black square on top of that drum head. Um, and that was my first snare drum, to be honest. But... When I found out that there were better snare drums, and I was still mm -hmm. into Pearl and had a Jet Procaro poster on the wall, I went after the free floater, six and a half inch brass Pearl free floater. And I love that drum. I love the concept, even though I dreamed and schemed of having the other shells that you could drop in there. Mm -hmm. um, I never got the maple or the steel or whatever. I just had brass. But the good thing is that segued into my meeting Greg Keplinger and realizing that he was a great snare drum builder and buying my first black iron shell from Greg. So I had a pearl free floater with a Keplinger black iron shell inside of it. Oh, no kidding. So that was my first snare drum. It was like lights on, like, oh, this one piece of the drum set can be great and <laughs> it could Whoa. change how you sound and change how you feel and that's when i you know taking the free floater out i paid attention to things like snare beds you know like how deep a snare bed is you know and what are, what edges look like and like it just opened up it was like a, a huge it was, it was a bay door it was a you know huge bay door of like looking into the world of the influence of shells what they're made of how they're cut Horizontal plies, vertical plies, bearing edges, 45s, 30s, baseball bat. What's a sling, slingerland edge? You know, what was a Yamaha edge? Like that whole concept and how it affects tuning and feel and time and how those drums recorded. It all started with me getting a pearl free floater so I could easily change a head, pull the shell out, and look at it. And then I started paying attention to where welds were and like asking questions about, you know, uh, beads and you know the the way that shells were built to have more integrity um, mm -hmm. you know full you know the bow tie lug versus the individual lugs the influence of nickeled brass hoops compared to steel hoops compared to die cast hoops um, it was really like I said that whole door of of options was open when I met Greg and he was putting together drums and and you know sort of taking whatever you could get at that point in time, which was like maybe 1994, um, you know, putting brass lugs on a drum and how that changed the sound of it versus, um, you know, cheap steel lugs. So that was, that was drum, no, real drum number one was a pearl free floater, but swapped out with a Kepling Air black iron shell. Wow. How did you convince him to make that piece? Or was he already making them? He was he was already making drums. I mean, he was making I don't know how compared to what he's making now, it wasn't nearly the same number. Uh, but uh, all it took was hearing that he made Matt Cameron snare drums and he made mm. you know 
some drums for Elvin as well. And I was like, I'm in, I'm in. And I was, I was 19 and working at a music store. So he was bringing them in to sell on consignment. I started as part-time. So I was able to spend time with him compared to the other drums in the shop, which if you think about it, it, like in 94, unless there was like a Tom of, you know, bell brass or some really heavy shell, there wasn't that many drum manufacturers that were making, you know, like a heavy, uh, you know, really articulate sounding shell. Um, and I, you know, I went down the, the yeah, man, I mean, I, I swear almost every snare drum I've had, whether it's the, the sonar manganese or the, or the, the Thomas or the Pearl Sensitones or every, when I was a Ludwig and Dorsey for 10 years, every single drum they made in their catalog, it was hand hammered bronze for a long time with them. That was my main drum. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, the Titanium Chief. I mean, Dunnett's drums are great. It's really, it is a hell of a wormhole. I'm glad that collecting snare drums isn't as expensive as collecting old cars, because I would have a, <laughs> I would have a real problem. All right. Well, we're definitely going to have to bring you back on if you will oblige when we get into hoops and all of that discussion. Um, but I want to end it with this is the whole first season of this podcast. I'm going to be trying to make this old gig percussion steel <laughs> snare drum. I mean, something that I would take on the road and not feel like I would be in danger. So this is all original, except for the heads and wires, even the throw off. What would you do to this hideously rusted $30 Craigslist drum to be able to take it on the road? Nothing. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm looking at it like, uh, like a pretty girl, like, don't change a thing, babe. <laughs> um, <laughs> So I would, so to take that on the road, so it would like hold together, um, cause that's what we're talking about. Right. If I take, yeah, I mean, if I take a drum I on get the through road, a song in the studio without it falling apart, destroying. Yeah. yeah. Um, I really like the, I have gone so far as to replace the springs that are on the throw offs. Um, so when you, you know, if you take that throw off apart, there's probably a spring in there that keeps tension. Mm-hmm. I have I have replaced those springs with a heavier gauge spring so that there's more tension, harder to crank down, but that also means harder to back off or it doesn't back mm. off because typically wires will back down with throw off. So I would I if I was really going to make it roadworthy, I would replace the throw off and I would put um, newer hoops on the drum and I would uh, also use. Um, because the inserts on those lugs aren't great, I would probably use um, some kind of it or index tuning plus lug lock or mm. um, the Tama, um, what are they called? The black and red. Come on, you're a gear guy. What are those? Yeah, I know what you're talking about. You know what I'm yeah. talking about. <laughs> anyway, I would use those components and make it immovable because mm, there's nothing okay. worse than putting a drum up on your kit on stage for a show and you look down and your tension rods on the you know between your pedals two yep. songs in so i would be using everything i could to basically lock that drum down and i i would replace the throw off potentially and that may mean making a couple plates to so that you don't have to redrill the shell but then again the shells it doesn't matter <laughs> redrill the shell <laughs> um but if it sounds amazing, it sounds amazing. And the only other thing or advice I would give to someone wanting to take that drum on the road is only play that drum to its potential. I would just lock it down in general. Like I would, I would put on possibly a different throw off or make sure that that one doesn't move. Make sure that the tension rods are locked down with some kind of a lug lock. Uh, I'd use cable instead of string on the wires. Um, I would accessorize it in a way that would make it immovable. Do you ever worry about tension rod splay? Does that ever concern you? I'm just noticing because I've been staring at this drum for a week. <laughs> about tension rod what? They're, They're like, like splaying. They're not aligned with the receipt with the lugs. Like maybe gaskets. Would you put gaskets on these things? You can't see it, but uh, are like you mean are they lines. are they like? Yeah, they're coming at an angle. Oh, the, yeah, potentially. So you mean like risers under the lugs? Yeah. You ever done that? I have never done that. I mean, you could, but I hear what you're saying. I mean, the other thing is before you do that, you might try some different hoops. 
mm-hmm. because it could be that the the hoops often you know more generic hoops are not cut perfectly and some might sit a little some might have uh eyes drilled you know or ears or whatever whatever we're calling them um that are a little tighter in and might not uh might not make you have that same angle it's funny i can't tell from here that 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 there's that much going on with tetra but i haven't had i haven't seen that problem in a long time um i mean how much will that drum withstand if you are a are you rim shotting it yeah i mean does it back I'm even looking at this this tension ride is all is completely bottomed out <laughs> does it does it back down um it doesn't uh well we're gonna i'm gonna be testing the crap out of it that's the that's the step one for the next episode is what does it sound like as it is and what happens if i hit rim shots for 10 minutes have you tried the the um the tight screws there's one of those in here in fact i just noticed that i must have replaced it when i because i'm sure it didn't have tension rods when i got the drum there's one in here somewhere the ones that have the little uh split with the nylon yeah yeah those are i when i was playing craviato for some reason maybe it was just the resonance of the craviato shells this one but the only tension rods that didn't move with the craviato shells were those um tight screws those are the only thing that didn't back down, and they're on all my drums. As a matter of fact, I had sold some Craviato kits over the years that I shipped them out, and people were like, "What's up with these tension rods? Like, do you have normal tension rods?" <laughs> and I had to like explain my my thinking, you know. But yeah, it's a it's a bummer, especially playing live because your front of house engineer works so hard when you get there and you set up to get your drum sound dialed for the room. And if within two songs you've got so much energy that you've completely changed the pitch of your entire drum set, yeah, and it's falling apart, then that creates a lot of work for everybody. Not to mention everything feels whack, you know. Um, I yeah, I would say tension rods. Make sure the throw off is going to move. Cable instead of string on the wires because I've seen I've seen string break. Mm-hmm. Um, and other than that, know your drum and what it's capable of. And if those hoops are the hoops that came with the drum, they're probably pretty flexible because they're made out of cheap metal. Mm-hmm. So I would find a, a hoop that is a, you know, a slightly stronger hoop that's not going to have any flex. You can often tell by um, taking a hoop and uh, pulling it off the drum and hitting it with a drum key in the air and listening to how pure the tone is of the drum hoop. Um, and if you have a hoop that's too thick, you know, like a um, some companies make like a, a stainless or like a really heavy steel hoop, to me, too heavy hoops are going to take away from the magic of that drum sound. So, mm-hmm. but then again, too too thin and cheap of hoops are not going to stay in place. So, I mean, I would I, it might take some experimentation in terms of the appropriate amount of addition slash subtraction to get that drum to stay put so it doesn't move. Yeah, the other the other challenge is not to spend three hundred dollars on a literally a thirty dollars snare drum as well. Right, but I mean, um, I mean Gibraltar hoops would work. Um, the Pearl Mighty hoop would be a bit much, probably mm-hmm. for that drum shell. Um, but I'm a fan of I'm a fan of the the Gretsch three hundred two hoops. I think that's a really cool hoop. Uh, it has mm-hmm. a much sharper attack with rim shots because of the double flange. So you might try something like that. I don't know. All right. Thank you. I'm going to see what I can do with it. So I appreciate you taking the time. Um, I'm serious. If you're into it, I'd love to bring you back on sometime because we could talk, we could nerd out forever. <laughs> and this is exactly what this show is supposed to be. So <laughs> if you're available on the invite, I'll be sending it to you often. Um, but for now... Anything we need to let people know upcoming? Is there any any show dates coming up or anything in the works? Um, or yeah, there's a there's a couple Death Cab shows that have um, recently been announced. Uh, one is in um, Ogden, Utah, and the other is I think in Bozeman, Montana. Um, hopefully, there'll be some more shows that happen in the fall. Um, we're not doing a lot this year. It'll be if we do much, it'll be. Um, towards the fall, uh, just letting this whole vaccination roll out and people's 
faith and trust in live events like mm -hmm. you know come head to head and then hopefully we'll be back out again we'll spend more time on the road in 2022 i'm sure as well as making a record but oh the only other thing i, I will mention is that we um we oh it was a 24 hour sale so hopefully <laughs> there'll be a, a re-release of it we just if you were fortunate enough we released a live album um on friday uh called live oh, at the wow. Showbox, and it's that phosphorus bronze gretsch snare drum and a Gretsch broadcaster, but the snare drum in particular is for a live record. I don't know. You might have to rethink your mm. your favorite sounding snare drum. It might be that drum. <laughs> Where is that available? Uh, it was it was available for twenty four hours on Bandcamp. Uh, there oh, will be a proper on? there will be a proper release. Um, okay, a little later this year, and it'll be on <laughs> on all formats. You might be able to stream one song still. Um, so you can look for it live at the show box. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jason. I appreciate it. And uh, I'll talk to you soon. Good to talk to you, Mike. See ya. All right, that's it for this week. Thanks for listening. Please, if you don't mind, go drop a review over on iTunes or wherever else you get this podcast. That definitely helps spread the word. And again, if you have any questions that you'd like me to address or suggestions for guests or topics, shoot them over to Mike at drumfactordirect.com or you can DM them at the Drum Factory Direct Instagram page, which I monitor regularly. Next week, we uh, yeah, we sit down with another one of my, my heroes and friends, Glenn Kochi of Wilco. So until then, have a good week. Blah, blah, blah.